how many of you run your own business or have done so? Okay. <laughs> uh, how many of you are people who work with uh, and for small business, helping them, supporting them in some way? Okay. And how many of you are students or academics? Okay, we have those as well. And some that fitted all, all three categories, I think. Okay. Uh, we are going to collect business cards um, in a little box there, and apparently there's a draw. Uh, you can win a bottle of wine, is that correct? Uh, unless I beat you to it. But I run out of business cards, so I can't enter the competition. So. Okay. Um, so we have something called the Australian Centre for Entrepreneurship Research. Uh, and I'm the director. I have parts of my advisory board here as well. And, and Paul Stephens in the back, who is one of the key researchers in the group. Uh, we have two missions. One is to be uh, the strongest in the country and internationally highly recognized for doing academic research on entrepreneurship and related topics, such as small firm growth. And the other one is to not be prisoners in our own ivory tower, but uh, to try to make this kind of research-based knowledge accessible and useful for practi practitioners as well. And some of the things that we produce are over at the table there. A little bit later, I will show you a video we have produced. And, uh, and these are some of our attempts to produce stuff for other, others than our academic peers. Um, on the website, which you can find easily by Googling ACE QUT, uh, you find the publications and stuff under that heading, publications, news, events, and resources. Um, there is something called Google Scholar for research nerds. That's Google for research nerds. And uh, if you Google small firm growth, this is one of my favorite boasting points. I'm just trying to enhance my credibility for today's topic. Uh, you can see that I'm, I'm all over that place there. Uh, I can forgive the guy at the top because he was my doctoral student. And I was at a conference a couple of months ago when someone had done navel gazing research on research and finding out that I, uh, I'm the most cited author uh, in the world on the topic of uh, growth, firm growth research. So I should know something about that. That does not mean that I know better than you do how to expand your business or that I believe I do. It means I know something about how to, how to do research on this that others feel uh, is somewhat interesting. First, uh, briefly about the ability to grow. And uh, just a little bit of fact finding uh, from one large survey based study. Uh, and this is what small business owner managers themselves report as being the major barriers to growth. Why have they not grown more than they have? And they can tick several alternatives that so doesn't sum to 100. And if you look at the top three reasons there, you see that it is not access to funding. Uh, it is not lack of management skills either. But I, my heroes are the 9% that admit that maybe uh, I'm not quite up to it. <laughs> Fierce competition, insufficient profitability, and insufficient demand. So what, what would that suggest to you? Yeah, they, they don't really stand out from the competition. right? So uh, they, they face fierce competition. It's difficult to have a, a high margin. And it's, it's difficult to, to uh, get sufficient demand to, to think about increasing the size of the business. And this, of course, is the reality for, for many small businesses. They, they, don't, they have not developed a strong competitive advantage that allows them to, to make uh, good profits and, and uh, go, get onto a good growth trajectory. And that is something we have to realize, that, that many small businesses uh, Probably most small businesses don't really, in their current form, have much of a growth potential. Um, <laughs> my entry into this was actually the, the observation that all economic and business theories about growth seem to take the willingness to grow the business for granted, whereas you only need to meet a few small business owner managers to realize that that is not necessarily the case. 
So, um, if we look, for example, at one of our major uh, ongoing projects, the Core C study, Comprehensive Australian Study on Entrepreneurial Emergence, uh, here we follow uh, many hundreds of ongoing business startups and uh, young, young firms. And this is from the nascent entrepreneurs, the ongoing business startups. Um, and attitudinal questions, what, what is your preference for, for this? Then you have 25% say they want to grow as much as possible, 75% say they want to keep it small and manageable. And that is what you find in other countries as well. This is actually a bit more growth oriented than what we have found both, both in Sweden and, and the US on, on average. 6% um, expect 10 or more employees after one year. That, that is not a very high percentage, but it's much higher than the 2% the in the Swedish study that, that said yes to that, uh, said uh, they, they expected more than 10. 26% um, expect 10 or more employees after five years is actually comparatively high, uh, but only 6% of the young firms have actually reached that size, or the surviving young firms have actually reached that size um, after, after five years. And uh, you see that the two-thirds of the firms expect to have less than half a million dollars in sales after five years. So relatively few of those expect to be more than than self-employment or part-time businesses. And an even higher percentage remain that small. So um, significant growth is uncommon, and it is usually, usually not even strived for. Uh, the favorite type of growth from a policy-making point of view is employment growth, because that reduces unemployment, creates new tax revenue. Uh, and the, I, I like this particular study. Uh, by Colin Gray from 1990. Uh, we had small business owner managers state what were important goals, and so they had a whole series of, of things they had they could I indicate whether or not it was an important goal for them. So how many do, what pro proportion do you think stated that uh, employment growth was an important goal? 8.6. That's a very high estimate. <laughs> <laughs> Not, not a single respondent in this, in, in this study indicated that employment growth was, was an important goal. Uh, I'm, I'm sure several of them, some of them wanted to grow, but it was not in order to increase employment. Increasing employment is a consequence of the real reasons you want to grow in sales and profitability and so forth. So, uh, but uh, quite a number of small firms become something like this. Uh, like five or 10 or 15 people, right? Uh, and um, what I was curious about in my very first piece of research back in younger stone age was why would small firm, as, firm managers not want to, want to grow or not want to grow? Some, some reason they would not want to grow? To, to maintain control of, of or manageability. That, that was certainly one of the dimensions, the, the feeling of being in control of what, what happens in the company. Profitability. Something else? Profitability. profitability, that is a reason to grow. And if you don't believe that growth would increase profitability, it, it removes an important incentive to grow. Something else? The return on risk associated with employing is not there. Uh, yeah, and uh, so you. You see it as risky to, to, to get bigger, and that is, that is a common perception as well. And as you, in, you indicated, it may depend on what the regulations are around that. Is uh, that a question of small firm managers or others? Small firm owner managers. So, so, yeah. Maybe it's uh, a lifestyle. Yeah, so may, maybe the, the very reason to go into business for yourself is, as odd, it is at odds with, with uh, growing bigger, being more feeling more dependent on other people again, and so forth. So. Now, this particular business did outgrow their size, because this is, this is Microsoft Corporation 1978. <laughs> and you have Bill Gates down in the bottom left corner there. <laughs> so what, what I found at the time was 
I've rummaged the literature, which, which is the research literature, which at this point was, was very manageable because there wasn't much interest in, in young and small firms in, in economic research at the time, which made, made it more manageable. But there, there was some. And I came up with those eight things that would be important to small firm owner managers and which may be affected positively or negatively by growth. The workload. Do, do they think that they have to work twice as much if they get twice as big, or do they see the opportunity, ah, oh, finally, I can afford to hire someone to, to work for me? Um, do they think that they may now be able to focus on more managerial work tasks as they want to, or do they fear that they will be removed from the real shop floor action or the interaction with customers or, uh, that, that they enjoy? Right? Do they think that they will make more money or, or, or not from growth? Of course, that is an important question. The sense of independence in relation to important customers, sources of finance, suppliers, and so forth. Would that be better or worse if you double the size of the company? The sense of supervisory control to be on top of everything that happens in the business. Uh, will that be improved or worsened? Employee well-being. Um, this is essentially about sort of the, the family-like atmosphere of of the small firm, um, or that is my interpretation of the actual results on that dimension. Um, but would this be a better or a worse place for the employees to work at if the company grew larger? Would the company become better or worse at surviving a severe crisis if it were twice the size? And would it be more difficult or harder to keep a good quality in products and services if you grow larger? And what we find here first is that across all dimensions, there are both positive and negative expectations. Uh, of course, for income, they're more positive than negative, but there, there's a full 40% who don't think that there would be much improvement. If you look at individual uh, response profiles, it's hard to find anyone who thinks that it will all be good or all be bad. So it's almost always a dilemma or a trade-off from expected good <laughs> improvements and, and, uh, and things that, that would uh, get worse. The greatest proportion of positive expectations, not unexpectedly, is for, for income. But like I said, 40% do not believe that it, it would boost income in this particular study. Um, the most negative expectations is for crisis vulnerability. That, uh, and that is probably often not a warranted concern. Uh, most research um, points out size and growth as positively associated with survival, not negatively. So that may be um, uh, a, a false concern in many, in many cases. The, the factor that was most strongly related to overall growth willingness was not the expected economic outcome, but it was this employee uh, well-being dimension, which more often was a negative influence on growth willingness than a positive influence. And that pro probably has to do with sort of the, the informal family-like character of, of the small firm up to the a size of 10, 15 people when you start to need to have um, a formal hierarchy and real delegation of power and so forth. So uh, for reasons like that, uh, for many small firm owner managers, it's not a given that they want to expand their business. Since then, a lot has happened in, in uh, growth on, on <laughs> in research on small firm growth, and it is increasingly recognized that growth is not really a, hom a homogenous phenomenon. Uh, firms grow in, in, in many different ways, and growth can be measured in many different ways. So we, we can grow, grow in sales dollars, in employment, in assets, in capacity. So for a restaurant, how many you can seat, or for a, a, a taxi company, the, the size of your car fleet, or things like that. Or you can can measure growth in production volume if, if you have a homogenous type of, of output. Uh, you can have mere volume expansion, doing more of the same, or you can diversify into new products, new markets. 
uh, you can integrate taking a bigger chunk of, of the, the value chain. Um, the growth can be organic, internal, adding genuinely new activities, or it can be acquisition-based, so you absorb existing economic activity into the, your own organization. The growth can be domestic or international. It can be measured as a percent or as in, in absolute numbers. So this, uh, on those di different types of growth often have, have different drivers and different consequences. So therefore, research has, has become more fine-grained, but th this is something that, that is still happening. And you still see a lot of, of, of research that just has one measure of, of, of growth. In one piece of research, we, we follow a very large uh, population of, of businesses that by the end of the time period studied had 20 or more employees. And most of them would be towards the lower end of that because that's always the size of a, uh, the, the shape of a size distribution of businesses. And uh, this was in relation to the, the in increasing popularity of, of talking about high growth firms and, or gazelles and their contribution to the economy. And um, we sort of suspected that uh, often those different studies of high growth firms, they, they talk about in part different things. Uh, so the first thing we, was, we did here was to have six different measures of growth in terms of organic employment growth, total employment growth, and sales. And this in relative terms, percentage, or in absolute numbers. And then we see how many firms um, fulfill those criteria. And as many as 41% are high growth firms. Almost half of all firms are high growth firms among the top 10% according to some criterion. Um, only 2.5% tick all the boxes. Right? So uh, it, you end up with, with quite different firms by different criteria. Then we, we add, developed as many as 19 different growth indicators uh, based on sales employment, based on, on the regularity of growth over time, the growth pattern over time, and so forth. And we found that by doing this, we, we could find seven distinct types of high growth firms so that are quite different animals. So we have one group, three there, there are acquisition growers. They, they spe specialize specifically in growing by acquisition. Uh, we have group number, number five that, that happened to have a, a one-off uh, growth in this period. Uh, and the years before, the years after, they don't grow at all, so the, uh, and so forth. So you, it, it's, it's much more complex than, than just singling out uh, an, one well-defined elite category of, of high growth firms. We had managed in this research to single out the difference between organic growth and, and, uh, and uh, acquisition-based growth. And that was not normally uh, done in this type of study based on, on broadly based uh, national business statistics. And in, in social science, we don't, we don't often do something like scientific discovery. <laughs> this is um, among the, the closest I've ever got to, to that, because you, you rarely find as strong uh, patterns in the data as we do here. So what we did was we, we first defined uh, the 10% of high growth firms, and in this case, based on on the average annual number of employees they had, had taken on. Taken on. Uh, so we were talking, it's only the 10% elite that is in, in this analysis. And then we break down their growth uh, in organic and, and total growth, and by size class, and by age category. And what it turns, what turns out is that the, the smallest size category, these are 20 to 50 employees at the end of the period. They, they may have started much smaller. They grew almost exclusively organically. The largest firms, those that are first defined as high growth firms based on, on total growth, they actually shrink in, in organic terms. They shrink quite dramatically in organic terms. So, um, so that what, what they represent is not job creation, but restructuring of the economy and possibly 
increasing productivity. And the same with age. The young firms grow predominantly uh, organically. Uh, the, the older firms, those that, that are more than 10 years old, which is not that old, uh, then already it is only 16% of the growth that is organic. So, and a strong linear relationship there. So, um, a very strong uh, association between age and size on the one hand and how the firms uh, grow on the other. We played a little bit more with this distinction between um, organic and um, and sales growth, not in, in, in this chart, but in the next. So this, this elite of high growth firms uh, through a recession, and now this is Stone Age, right? Uh, 1990s, but we can imagine that this is a global financial crisis instead, and you would probably see something similar uh, in, in, in the data. So we have singled out the growth elite of, of the fastest growing firms, and they are um, at the top there. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't be surprised that, there are, that they are above the others because they are defined as the most growing firms. But what is surprising that is that as, as a group, they sort of march on through that recession as if nothing happened. They, they maintain the same uh, level of growth through, through that period. Whereas the other 90%, the pink curve, they exactly follow what the eco economy does, or they, they are what the economy does uh, during this period. They find it difficult to, to keep up their employment, so they are in, in negative numbers. So then you wonder, okay, were they just lucky, or have they managed their fate <laughs> through this period? And in the next chart here, and this is on a per firm basis, and it's um, uh, it's the high growth firms here. And you can see that the pink curve, the, their organic growth dips during the recession. So just like all the other firms, they find it difficult to, to maintain or to grow or ma maintain their, their volume through this, this period. But their acquisition growth instead increases during this period. And this indicates that this is strategic, that, that they, they are growth-oriented in the years before the recession. They have done well. They, they have, they, they have the, the means to make acquisition. In the, in the recession, the acquisition targets become cheap, so they can, they can acquire them at, um, at a, a favorable price. And then when the economy turns back to normal again, they, are again they again have a 50-50 mix of organic and acquisition growth, whereas in the middle there, uh, there's much more acquisition happening. So um, it has been suggested in some other research that we, we can't really explain growth. It, it's, it's basically <laughs> random which firms will grow or not. Uh, this suggests that at least there are some firms that, that seem to manage their, their, their fate strategically. Uh, much later, we, we used the same data for this um, type of analysis, again, based on the organic versus acquisition-based growth. And um, seeing what, what are the implications for the next period from those different types of growth. And um, so if you grow through organic means and through acquisition in one period, what does that mean for your ability to grow organically in the next period? And what the results suggest and what we theoretically predicted was that organic growth is difficult to sustain. So it is, you, you take the, the low hanging fruit first and when you have had a period of growth, you need to consolidate and you, you get a bit exhausted from from that exercise, it, it, it is difficult to continue to do that in the next period. Whereas acquisition growth in one period uh, serves as an injection that improves your ability to grow organically in the next period. Supposedly, this is uh, old activities now being under new management. They can see new opportunities with 
with this acquired business or they have synergies between the acquired business and their old business and that allows them to, to continue on a growth trajectory. Now we know from a lot of research on mergers and acquisitions that this is popular among large corporations and according to most of the research it doesn't really pay except for a few people. <laughs> uh, the, the, the costs of trying to, to merge those, those giants are often much higher than, than uh, anticipated and the gains are not as, as big as, uh, as they think and the, the uh, share owners don't really benefit from, from, from this activity. Uh, the indication is that for among SMEs, uh, maybe acquisition is relatively uh, speaking a, a, a pretty good idea, but there's not much of it. There is relatively little uh, acquisition activity happening among, among smaller and medium-sized firms. Okay, this is another piece of research where we looked at uh, sales growth and employment growth uh, up till this point mostly looked upon as, as a methods choice or a methods problem that um, should we measure it this way or should we measure it th that way uh, why is it that they are not very highly correlated in, in some studies and so forth so um, what we argued here was that uh, we started with something called tra transaction cost economics uh, sort of a theoretical school of thought um, that argues that the cost of, of putting things in the market in terms of search costs, of, of information costs, of sort of finding the right alternatives, in terms of bargaining costs to negotiate deals and, and making sure that, that um, you can trust the, uh, your, your, your partners and enforcement costs that you, you really make sure that contracts will be, uh, will be followed and so forth. So when, when those transaction costs are high, then it makes more sense to do things internally. And then sales and employment growth would, would, would go together. If, if uh, transaction costs are low, then it is more effective to put things on, on the market and to buy services, and then you don't have to have as many employees, even if you grow, grow in sales. And um, we found that 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 basically holds that reasoning that, that the, the, those things go more closely together when transaction costs are, are high. But the, the interesting finding is this red arrow with, with the nature of the environment, which suggests that this only holds in a, in a, really, in a tough economic environment. Uh, so what that suggests is that when, when the conditions are more, more benign, we get a bit sloppy. <laughs> and not as economically rational in, in our behavior uh, because the environment sort of allows you to, to uh, have things uh, organized suboptimally and, and you, you will still survive in the market and, and have enough of a profit to, to survive. I was a bit concerned that I had too much material, so I've probably rushed this <laughs> a bit so far. But that, that's good, so we're going to have some, some time for Q&As at, at the end. Now we're back to the Core C study again. You remember this is an on, now ongoing study of, of nascent and young firms. So they, they're in the startup process, and, uh, or they are up and running, but they are still young. And what we have here is, um, do I have a pointer here? Yes. <laughs> um, we have what we call regular firms. This is re these are random samples of, of nascent firms and of young firms. And we have high potential firms. That is a judgment sample. It, it's ba based on a combination of, of what we call the human capital, the education and experience of the founders, of the technological sophistication of the business, and of the aspirations of the business. So, um, we, we expect them, not everyone in that category, but more in that category to become significant businesses. And then we have dream, oh sorry, 
dream in quotation marks. That, that is what the nascent businesses say they want to do, right? what they want to achieve. And reality, that is what the young firms have achieved when they are roughly five years old. And, and the question for, to the nascent is also what, where, where they want to be in five years' time. And you can see that there's quite, quite uh, a decent level of ambition. To 40, almost 40% 40 say they, they, they want to be internationally active. Uh, but only 17% have, uh, have actually become that. 12% uh, say that they want to have at least 25% international say, sales. 7% say they, they want to have more international than domestic sales. The actual figures there are somewhere in between uh, one, one third or half of, of, of those numbers. Among the high potential startups, the, the figures, the ambition, level of ambition is much higher, as is the actual outcome, but uh, the relation between them is the same. You see, the realization is, is much lower than, than the plans of compar comparable firms, and particularly uh, here for, for having more than 25% international sales, which almost two thirds of them aim for, and, and not even one fifth have actually achieved. This is, it is not following exactly the same firms, but they, 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 are, they are comparable samples. So it, 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 is, it is fair to say that this is, is roughly uh, comparing dreams with, with reality. Um, that said, uh, we, we're still a bit impressed by the, the level of international ambition, ambition of the nascent businesses. We didn't even plan to ask those questions from, from those who were still in the startup process until we'd done the pilot study and found out that, that uh, there was actually a reason to, to ask about that. And one reason for that is that we have lots and lots of migrants in this country. And, and so you have business founders who, who trade with their, their country of origin or their parents' country of origin. Um, another recent study where we go into the international dimension, and this is a bit messy to, to put in a uh, boxes and arrows diagram, um, but um, essentially the reasoning here is that the international presence leads to learning that you can, you can transform into uh, new products and new markets um, either in international markets or in the domestic market. And what we found is that, yes, such learning does occur. And uh, so the international presence leads to more, more uh, novel initiatives in the international markets. But we found very limited or no evidence that they actually bring that home to the domestic market as well. Um, we also found that, that firm, firm age uh, is a factor in this. We expected young firms to be better at translating those international experiences into new products, new product ideas, and that um, older firms would be better at translating this into uh, new market, uh, additional entry into new international markets. And we found the former, but not, not the latter. The younger firms are better at, at, at uh, absorbing new knowledge in international markets and are based on that uh, develop new products for those international markets. Uh, the effect on uh, uh, new products in the international market, the, the effect on the ability to add additional international markets was, was age neutral. And very importantly, <laughs> um, growth in itself is not the same as good business performance. Um, and many small firm managers suspect that is the case. Like I said, 40% of them did not, in my original study, did not necessarily expect growth to lead to, to uh, an, an, a greater income flow for them as owner managers. Uh, an early meta-analysis, a meta-analysis is when you stack up all the research studies uh, you can find and, and see what, what is the, the, the collective message across all those studies. Uh, they found that 
there is a positive association be between growth and profitability. But this occurred only in studies that were across industries, not within industries. So that suggests that it may not be that growth drives profitability or profitability drives growth. It is a favorable, favorable industry conditions that let you grow and let you be profitable without these two being uh, causally related. Uh, we found this background work in our piece of re research that I will show you soon that it is very common, in a, especially in entrepreneurship research, to some extent in strategy research as well, to use growth as the sole uh, outcome performance measure and to interpret it as success. Um, and that is problematic in the light of the next study, the Finnish study here that uh, had comprehensive data and correlated all kinds of, of performance measures and found that sales growth is not positively associated in a consistent ma manner with any other performance measures such as return on assets, return on investment or, or so forth. And that, that uh, is the case regardless of industry, regardless of, of firm age. So we, we really need to look at growth in conjunction with, with uh, other performance criteria. And this is where hopefully we'll be able to, to show you a little sketchbook video so you can listen, not to me, but to my co-author, Paul Steffens, who is in the back row and who is the narrator for, for the, the video. Background and research question. Praise for rapidly growing firms, the gazelles as they are sometimes called, is common in media and also in political rhetoric. These fast growing firms, we are told, create the bulk of new jobs and new wealth, and are therefore the heroes of the economy. And surely, sometimes they are. Several academic theories also portray firm growth as a good thing. Economies of scale, experience effects, and first mover advantages are all assumed to benefit those firms that grow larger or more quickly than their competitors. More recently, phenomena like eBay and Facebook are clear examples of what economists refer to as network externalities. That the value of a product or service dramatically increases with the number of users. But is growth universally a good thing for firms? On the flip side, we also hear horror stories about firms that grew too quickly to their own death by losing financial control and or growth creating internal organisational turmoil. Indeed, many important lessons were learned in the dot-com bubble. And let's face it, to achieve rapid volume growth, all you need to do is to sell very cheaply and for sure customers will love you, grow in numbers and buy more, but financially it would be sheer disaster if you don't cover your costs. So when we are assessing the value of growth, we also need to consider how sustainable it is and what are its likely effects on profitability. This is what we tried to determine in our research. We posed the question, which firms are more likely to be able to achieve both high growth and high profitability? Do firms become more profitable as a result of their growth? Or is it the small but profitable firms that tend to scale up their businesses while maintaining their high profitability. How we investigated this. To investigate this question, we used two large multi-year data sets. First, the Business Longitudinal Survey from the Australian Bureau of Statistics provided data on some 3,500 small and medium enterprises, SMEs. A similar data set from Statistics Sweden provided information on another 2,500 Swedish SMEs. We divided firms into those performing below or above the average of their industry in terms of growth and profitability. In 
this gave us four categories of firm. Those low on both growth and profitability, we labelled poor. While those high on both growth and profitability, we called the stars. Those with high profitability but low growth were classified as profit. And finally, those firms with high growth but low profit were labelled as growth. In order not to make small changes way too heavily in the results, we also created a middle category. We then analysed how firms change category over time, particularly which firms become stars. What we found. The results were very clear. Star firms are much more likely to originate from the profit category than the growth category. In fact, instead of becoming stars, a disturbing number of the growth firms ended up in the poor category. That is, ending with both substandard growth and profitability. By contrast, relatively few of the profit firms ended up in the poor category. Hence, our results were very clear. In general, SMEs do not grow profitable. The vast majority of those who try to build profitability through growth can neither sustain their growth nor reach high profitability. Rather, it is the firms who have already shown an ability to achieve high profitability at a smaller scale that later embark on a trajectory of growth while sustaining their relatively high level of profitability. These results hold up independently for Australian and Swedish firms as well as in a number of breakdown analyses by industry and size classes. We interpret this as suggesting that sound growth usually starts with a sound level of profitability. In all, our research is in line with Clay Christensen's motto, be patient for growth, but be impatient for profits. High profitability in turn is likely to be based on some unique advantage that appeals to a sufficiently large number of customers. That is what firms should focus on in the first place, developing an attractive market offer that allows them to be profitable. Once this is achieved, the firm can undertake sound growth. This growth can be financed to a large extent by the firm's retained earnings from its earlier profitable performance, or possibly further boosted by external finance attracted from the firm's already strong results. In contrast, firms who are too eager to grow without something unique to offer the market will have to buy market share by lowering the selling price or spending more on marketing. Hence, this will lower rather than increase the firm's profits. Business and policy advice. While we concede that there may be situations when rapid growth is necessary for success. Our results strongly suggest that this is not usually the case. Rather than focusing simply on encouraging firms to grow, policymakers and investors should put more emphasis on the development of a firm's unique strengths through which it can achieve above average profitability at a modest size. It is this that usually provides a sound foundation on which to build sustainable and profitable growth. We should encourage firm founders and owner managers to initially focus on developing their specific and unique strategic advantages that can deliver high profitability. Supported by a sound underpinning of profitability, more business founders may be able to realise the full potential of their businesses by subsequently growing them larger. Okay, I think we we'll had possibly one more, <laughs> one more slide, and this is 
uh, a popular idea that you that you will encounter both in in academic or semi-academic literature and in 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 what we call airport books in in uh, popular management literature that sort of there is a sequence of growth stages with uh, which all present their, they develop in a in, in a typical sequence and they all uh, uh, come with with their own typical uh, challenges and uh, this is an early one by Greiner, one of the most well-known ones. Um, some colleagues uh, collected more than 100 models of this kind in the literature. More than 100. <laughs> and and cross-analyzed them, and they have between 2 and 11 stages or something like that, and they do not converge. Uh, essentially, this idea of a, a fixed set of stages that that come in a, in a given sequence um, is something you should take with a, a, a big pinch of salt. But what is worth uh, contemplating in this literature is the description of typical transition problems. Of, of the, they, they may not come in exactly the, the, the sequence or in the packages that uh, a specific uh, author um, suggest, but they, they, they do happen. And so they, the discussion of such problems and their solutions, the, the us and them with, between the, the, the pioneer employees from the early, early firm and, and, and when you grow larger and you have newcomers who haven't, haven't been with the firm in, in, in that early stage. The, the tendency to grow out of your systems and, uh, and therefore you may lose financial control and things like that. Uh, there there is, a, is a number of of, of uh, typical growth problems that, that are discussed in that literature and, and which is, is, is worth uh, contemplating. But it is not this neat sequence of, of, of growth stages that repeat themselves across all types of, of, of firms and industries. So um, that, was, that was all. Um, if you want to find our website, the easiest way is to Google Ace, Ace QT. If you like the video, you Google Ace QT video and you will find a YouTube video. It's like a, the fifth hit or something like that. And then you, you share that with others so that we, we, we get many likes and many downloads, right? <laughs> and um, if you want to get on, on our mailing list, you can email me or, 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 or Karen uh, and we can make, can make sure that you, you get our newsletter and invitations to to events like this. So I used almost all the, the designated time, um, but uh, we have, oh, you haven't collected the? Mm. Yeah. And, and we do have some time for question and answer. So if there is, if there are any questions? Yes. Um, yeah, you have a slide there about growth by acquisition. Yeah. And you said that uh, uh, large firms tend to not do very well at it. It tends not to be engaged by smaller firms. Yeah. Um, so I guess my question, I've got two questions. One is, are small firms successful at doing it when they do it? And secondly, uh, are they not doing it because they just don't have the, the finance and the instruments to be able to do acquisition? Yeah, yeah. Good, good, good question. Um, I mean, there, there are two ways to... to um, to interpret the, the basic patterns there. So, uh, one is that everybody would prefer to grow through acquisition, but only the, the large firms or the, the, the more established firms have the means of doing that. Um, so that is sort of the, 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 the more large firm friendly interpretation. Uh, the, the more uh, small firm or young firm friendly interpretation say is that uh, young and small firms still have the creativity to grow organically, whereas the large dinosaurs they have to <laughs> have to acquire um, in ideas from, from elsewhere in order to get anywhere. And probably there, there is a there, there is some some bit of the truth of, in in both of those perspectives. Uh, I should say there, there's not a large a large amount of research into this, but the indication from from the little research I've been involved in and in, in, that I know of is that. Uh, 
yeah, uh, acquisitions and mergers are probably more popular than they should be among large firms and probably less popular than, <laughs> than they should be among, among small and medium-sized businesses. That, so, and, and those small and medium-sized firms who do it seem to be more discriminating or realistic about what, what acquisition activity they should engage in and, and not. And so the, the outcome on average is, is more favorable. Yep, we have one there. Yeah, with the, you made a comment around um, international exposure and, yep. and companies are growing through the international footprints. Um, is there any information around uh, which, which regions are particularly targeted? I'm sure we have an idea of that. So as to which regions possibly would be, how, how quickly those small businesses launch into an international market and how successful they are at actually mm -hmm. sustaining that yeah. position? We, we, we don't have that from our research. Uh, the, the, the traditional internationalization model, which is developed by some of my Swedish colleagues, <laughs> uh, therefore called the, the Uppsala model, sort of, it, it, it builds on geographic and psychic distance. So you, you, you go first to neighboring market or, and, and, and markets that are culturally similar. So uh, in the case of Australia, that would be to go to Anglo-Saxon markets and to, to, to Southeast Asia, because that these are sort of, and New Zealand, of course, that you, Oh, well, that's part of, of, of Anglo-Saxon markets. Um, and then there's sort of the or, counter argument of the, uh, well, once new phenomenon of born globals or businesses that, that go to, to very distant international markets almost from start. And it was actually for the, the concept of born global was, was in a, an Australian uh, research report from the 1990s, uh, early 1990s. Uh, and that de definitely happens as well in, in, in for example, some high-tech industries and where, where uh, your, your logical market may be only a, a small number of, of large firms that are spread around the globe and the founders are um, well-educated, well-traveled and internationally experienced already so it's easier to, to, to take those steps. I, I, I know one, one piece of Israeli research that sort of so, well, it, it isn't really one or the other. Those, those that look like born globals, there, is a, there are steps there as well. So the, 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 first, uh, the first international move may, may be through an international agent, and it, it takes some time before they have any kind of own operations on those distance markets. So, Yes. Pierre, in your, um, I guess it's an add-on to your conversation just now about um, the Bourne Global uh, companies. In some of your other findings, in did you find um, anything in specific um, industry areas? So, you know, was high tech finding certain things in in some of those other studies, or was it generally you did it across everything? We, we <laughs> from the Core C project, we have one, one report that is specifically on, on, on internationalization, the international um, aspirations and, and activities. I'm sure we have an industry breakdown there that I can't remember <laughs> by, by heart, so there's some information on it. Um, but uh, uh, we, we don't have a lot. We also know from, from the, the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, which compares uh, early stage uh, startups uh, across countries that uh, the, the one dimension where, where Australia is, is not uh, above average, I hope I'm right here, <laughs> Paul, is, is on the level of international activity and that, that is, is um, almost certainly a, a consequence of, of our geographical location. It's much easier to become international if you're, if you're in the smack in the middle of Europe, I mean, you're, and, and you're a small nation to start with, you can't go very far without, without being international. So it's not really a fair comparison. Yes, Richard. I have a sort of similar question. That, um, um, if you have a look at the structural change over the economy in the last 20 years, um, you'll see globalisation, but also an increasing use of outsourcing. Um, with respect to outsourcing, previous employees out of necessity become entrepreneurs mm -hmm. um, and their ambition is just self-employment. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily have an ambition. Mm -hmm. um, so what I was wondering was that has there been any studies on looking at um, the extent to which the measures of all these characteristics has actually changed through time 
and linking that back to um, structural change in advanced countries. And that also goes to advanced countries becoming less um, agrarian, industrial, moving more towards being services. Mm. And, and that includes services in the financial sector, and the financial sector is taking off quite substantially. Mm. And um, entrepreneurship in the financial sector may be more growth sort of area, high value add. Mm. Um, so it will be interesting to see if, if some of these observations um, if we can disentangle the extent to which it's related to structural change. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure we are firmly in the topic of small firm growth here, but uh, anyway, um, I'm, I'm sure there, 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 would be, there would be research in, in that area that, I, that I'm, I'm not uh, up to speed with or, or, or can't recall right now. The, the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor that I mentioned has been running now since 1998. Uh, unfortunately, it was not as rich in the data it collected back then as it is now, and not as rich in the number and type of countries. But we, we have increasingly longitudinal evidence, so it should be, it should be possible to, to, to capture those kinds of trends. And they have those different kind of countries, and we know, for example, that, that in, in the innovation-driven economies, you have this large sector of, of rather advanced business services that, 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 that is growing. Uh, so it should be possible to pick up, probably not yet very reliably, especially since we have the global financial crisis messing up the date for, for, for a few years as, as well. So. Yes, Paul, killer question. <laughs> Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, Richard, I know that um, with the, the Gem study, they are looking at that because there's a concern that. that sorry, there's a concern that uh, some of the numbers are really about what we call non employing entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. which is just really a restructuring of uh, employment to uh, contract positions uh, might be inflating the numbers. Mm -hmm. the, prob the problem is, of course, that necessity entrepreneurs look the same. Uh, so that is uh, entrepreneurs that are forced into entrepreneurship as a result of not having alternative employment. Uh, so uh, it is particularly through the GFC difficult to disentangle those two, but uh, some colleagues in, in the GEM study are, are looking at trying to uh, get, get some sense of that. So but we don't have the answers yet. Mm. In Queensland, certainly anecdotally, we saw that the government is touting that we've got this new firm, accelerated new firm growth under their first two terms which I suspect is actually a lot of self-employment. Uh, almost anywhere you look, uh, the, 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 the big numbers are self-employment or, or intended to be self-employment. The problem we have is we, 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 even if with, with, with a tougher uh, definition of entrepreneurship, we can't disregard them because some, some of them will develop uh, into more significant businesses even if initially it was something that looked like a rather mundane business and it, it looked like self-employment only. So. Wouldn't you get access, though, to ABN tax data that would be able to help you inform that? Because you would see that there's, you know, mm. capacity or where they are. Yeah, I, 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 my experience so far is that it is difficult to, to get access to, to data as a researcher for Sort of integrity reasons, yeah, yeah, yeah. In 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 my in my old life in Sweden, I mean, they they introduced relative, they they yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they they introduced rather tough uh, data integrity laws in Sweden as well. But but academic researchers were believed to be angels, so we could do a, a lot <laughs> with 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 data uh, relatively easily. Uh, whereas here, there's much more caution around releasing data for, for research purposes. I think the tax office is having problems distinguishing between the self and the business. Yeah. 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 yeah, any more questions? Okay. We have, we have some... Uh, yeah, thank you very much. And we have some... Uh, <laughs> uh, Vincent Nibbison. <laughs>